Well, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and a special to welcome to those of you who are joining us via live stream this morning. Thank you for being with us, too. I wanted to look today at this idea of original sin. So for those of you who might be unfamiliar with this concept, it's, um, it's something that's taught in some Christian uh, traditions. And it's about the sin that uh, is claimed to be something that all humans are born with. It's inherited. It's inherited from the first humans that we are told about in the Bible, Adam and Eve. And it's the sin that they committed of disobedience in being told that they should not eat from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you know they got tempted by the serpent, and they ate the fruit. And guess what? They were banished. Now, if you don't know about this, the remedy, <clears throat> excuse me, the remedy for original sin is baptism. And I was raised in Roman Catholicism, and I know things have very much evolved in the way they teach some of these things. But when I was a kid, we were taught that if a baby died before it was baptized, that baby couldn't go to heaven. It went to limbo, which was very nice, but it wasn't quite as good as heaven. And there was something about that idea that just didn't sit well with me. And you have to understand, I was raised in Roman Catholicism with the idea in our family. It was like, don't ever accept any dogma that doesn't make sense to you. Be respectful. Take the good in. But if something doesn't make sense, question it. And this idea to me of this baby that is a creation of God, a child of God, has this sin on its soul. And it takes a human, a priest, to intercede to fix the baby so that God would then accept the baby into heaven. I went, what does that say about God? It kind of felt blasphemous to me. And I remember approaching a priest about this and asking and you know, explaining why I was confused. And I remember the priest looking at me and go, going, you know, well, aren't you the inquisitive one? Good for you. He said, you know, maybe the way we teach things in catechism isn't all that there is to know. And he said, it's up to all of us to question things and go deeper. If we want to understand God, we can't depend on others to explain God. We each have to find our own connection. So that was very much in keeping with the way I was raised. That felt very good. So it did cause me to question. And I think it's no surprise that years later, bless you, I uh, found my way into this teaching, into Science of Mind, where our founder, Ernest Holmes, he stated emphatically that we are never to take anything he said or wrote as the final word, that all ideas are limited and God is limitless and therefore we should question and find our own ways of connecting to the divine. But I have to say that <clears throat> as much as I questioned the dogma of this idea of original sin and the idea that one has to be baptized to be accepted by God, I would go to the um, ceremonies, christenings and baptisms, and something deep inside of me would be very moved that beyond my rational thoughts about it, there was something that resonated in my soul. And so you know, I kept examining this, and I wanted to share some of the thoughts I've had about that. If we go back to this idea of original sin, and let's remember that sin is an archery term. That means missing the mark. It's an error. If we go back to the original error, and this idea that we go to the time of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the moment that they ate from the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they fell from grace. They were banished from Eden. Now, this story is very widely accepted as an allegory. And in Science of Mind, 
whether the stories we read in scripture are allegorical or are, have some basis in historical fact, they all are interpreted metaphysically, meaning the way we look at them is that each character represents some part of our consciousness. Each situation represents some metaphor for the things that happen to us as we go through life. And so there are different uh, metaphysical interpretations about the story of Adam and Eve, but I think the most common one I've heard is that Adam and Eve represent the masculine and feminine aspects of our being, that we have these two sides, all of us, no matter what our gender, and that the two of them, when they're in balance, when we feel our wholeness of these different aspects of our being, and we're in a place of just feeling so connected with good. In the Garden of Eden is this place where everything was beautiful, it was wonderful, there was nothing negative, and then all of a sudden, their, their idea of eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents those ways that one moment we feel connected, feel our oneness with God, and then something in the world distracts us and we get pulled away. And we lose our sense of oneness. We fall back into error thinking, into a sense of duality. The ways that we get tempted, feeling, oh, I have to have that to be happy, mesmerized by conditions in the world. Even our physical senses give us a sense of me versus you, me versus God, me versus the world. And it's that sense of separation that brings up all the negative feelings, such as shame, resentment, anger, alienation, which then lead to the negative conditions in the world. Let's be clear, it's not God that banishes us, okay? Unconditional love doesn't banish any part of itself. We are all living within this one life of unconditional love. We are all held in unconditional love. But it's our error thinking, it's our false perception of being separate from the divine that prevents us from experiencing our divine nature to the fullest. And it's not just a one-time thing if you haven't noticed. There isn't just, you know, this isn't about what happened eons ago when the first humans felt separate from God. You know, this goes on all the time where we feel connected, we feel so one, and then something happens and we don't. We feel connected, we feel at one, and then something happens and we don't. From that point of view, I would say there is absolutely nothing original about original sin. It's happening all the time. Have we ever found ourselves in that heavenly place of feeling so aligned with God's love, God's joy, God's beauty, a sense of awe, you know, the wholeness of our being, and then suddenly some human condition in our lives or in the world pulls us off center and we spiral. We feel shame, we feel guilt, we feel anger, we feel resentment, we feel lack. So the idea of baptism is it's a ritual that represents washing away, clearing our consciousness of the ways that we are not seeing things correctly, the error thinking, the error beliefs of being separate from God. It's clearing our consciousness of the illusion of duality so that we can know our oneness with God once again, step back into that Eden, heavenly experience. And, you know, I think the reason that when I've attended these traditional ceremonies of baptism and christenings, the reason I felt touched by them is I think there's an acknowledgement that from the very beginning of our human experience, from the very beginning when we come into this life, we're faced with this sense of separation that we need to overcome. You know, when babies come into the world, all of a sudden they feel separate from their moms. They, you know, the first things they do is cry, right? It's, it's got to be a very frightening moment. If the baby came out absolutely feeling its oneness with God and everything being perfect, the baby would come out like, whoa, that was intense. 
Mom, you okay? That was great. I'm here. <laughs> Instead, you know, they cry. They feel that separateness. We feel that from the very beginning of our lives. And so the baptism is this ritual of representing our commitment, those of us who are there to love the child, to helping it, to remember that, yes, this is a condition we all have to deal with, and we're committed to getting beyond it. Yeah, I love that in Science of Mind, in our baptism and christening ceremonies, what it's really about is we ask all of the parents, all of the adults or parental figures in a child's life to commit to constantly reminding the child of its oneness with God. That even in those times where the child needs to be disciplined or scolded, that it's coming from a place of reminding the child that there's a spark of God's nature in you that's bigger than your behavior, and calling that child to align with that behavior and to absolutely let it come forth. And I think that's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful when we have the people in our lives who do that, when we have those kinds of support systems. But we also need to and get to take responsibility for our own spiritual evolution. We get to claim our power by doing our own spiritual work to rid ourselves of our perceptions of separation. And so that's why we engage in regular spiritual practice. That's why we promote that so heavily, is for us to take time daily, at least once a day, if not more, to be still, to meditate, to contemplate that presence of goodness in us that's there no matter what's going on in our lives, to pray, to study, and to step out of our day-to-day -day routines and commune, to commune with that essence that's there, that we can remember is there, and that we can call forth into whatever is going on in our lives. And so we have the capacity to remember our oneness with the divine and allow that nature to be more fully expressed and experienced in life. But I don't know if you've noticed that even when we do have that regular spiritual practice, we can still be pulled off center once we get back into our day-to-day -day lives. You know, there are those days, I'm going to guess that we could all say this has happened to us, where we've done our spiritual work, we've meditated, we've felt the connection, we've journaled, we've done our prayer work, we are so prayed up, and then we get out into the world, and there's that person that won't let us into that lane on the freeway. There's that boss, that spouse, that parent, that child that just doesn't appreciate all that we've done for them. One that Dr. Mark and I seem to share. There's that person in the grocery store in front of us in the 12 items or fewer line that has 13 items. I've counted them. Thank you very much. <laughs> or we get some very sad news. Something in us gets triggered, and we act in some very unloving way and then feel badly about it. There we are, back into our sin, into our error thinking of feeling separate from God. What do we need to do? Now, right now, we're not seeing the greater potential of God in us or in others or in the situation. Time for a baptism, folks. Time for a baptism. Time to find ways to clear our minds and hearts of that feeling of separation. And you know, the, the nice thing about a regular spiritual practice is that it helps us to build the foundation in consciousness to notice more quickly when we're going off track and to find our way back to that connection with spirit. But there are also ways that we can support ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives as we go about our day-to-day -day activities to keep that sense of connection going. So you find yourself suddenly pulled off center by something. What are so many of these tools? Just stop, take a breath. You know, go to one of our mantras, God is the love that I am. You know, this too shall pass. You know, 
uh, I bless and I accept. I bless you, I accept you. I bless the situation, I accept the situation. <clears throat> Excuse me, we take our attention off the situation and back to God. And you know, I was, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of an Orthodox Jewish friend of mine who had said he was in, um, I knew him back in my business corporate days, and he had a very, very high pressure job. And he was telling me that in this day and age where things move so quickly, where it's so easy to get distracted and lose our sense of oneness with God, that he had started implementing many Sabbaths in addition to practicing the Sabbath, that he incorporated many Sabbaths into his life, many Shabbats. So going back to the idea of Sabbath, Shabbat, is the idea that on you know, sundown, on Friday night to sundown Saturday, you disengage from your day-to-day -day activities. It's a time to pray, to meditate, to sing, to play, to be joyful, to indulge in life's pleasures, to feel grateful. And you know, this friend of mine, as he talked about, it's that time that allows us to just step back, rejuvenate, and be reminded of our spiritual nature. And he said, of course, God's nature is one of giving and receiving. It's both. And so he found, religiously, he practices, practiced this that twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon, he found time where he would do something that would enable him to stop and just realign, feel the goodness around him. It might be by taking a walk and just feeling the breeze on his face or acknowledging the feeling of the sunlight, stopping and smelling the flowers, whatever. Just something simple like that. And then also to find a way to do something kind for someone, to share of that divine nature. And he said by that, he kept remembering that presence of God that was right there with him in every moment, which really eliminated so much of the stress in his life. And so that's something I would invite us to look at, you know, adopting as a spiritual practice. What are ways that we could support ourselves? Like, just to stop periodically. There's such wisdom to that stop and smell the roses idea. For me, it's stop and smell the coffee. Oh my God, I'm in heaven when I smell coffee. You know, to stop, to really take a moment to take in the essence of God's nature, and we're going into a season of thanksgiving, give thanks. Give thanks for the ability to feel that, to enjoy that. And at the same time, find a way to share of God's nature, some act of kindness, some way of sharing something playful or joyful with someone, to give. And it can be very simple things. You know, give a smile. You know, offer a prayer. You know, just say something kind. Call that person that you haven't spoken to in a long time just to say hello. These simple things, when we put our attention to them, and again, give thanks for that divine nature within that allows us to feel the joy of sharing, the joy of taking in. That allows us to stay aligned and to wash away that error thinking of being separate. I was just talking uh, on Friday to my friend, Reverend Bonnie, up in uh, Ventura, and I was talking to her about this idea, and she said, you know, one of her greatest experiences around this was how terrified she used to be of flying. She hated flying. And she's had to go on some very long trips. She recently flew to Jordan. And she said she used to dread long trips. She felt very separate from God on a long trip. But she said, she decided to make the trip about how many ways could she find to be kind to someone in the airport? How many ways could she see God in the beauty around her and give thanks while she was in the airport, on the plane? And you know, it, it would be just as simple as looking and seeing the diversity of God and all the different people in an airport. A simple kindness like someone dropped something on the plane and picking it up for them and get it, giving it to them and doing it with a sense of love. She said, that's transformed that feeling of separation to looking forward 
to these experiences. We all, I think, have the capacity to pause and just take in something good and give back something good and thereby realign with our divine nature. Let's remember that along with this idea of original sin or error is the idea of grace, which is unconditional love, that there's nothing you need to do to earn God's love. You are loved unconditionally by the universe. It's just a matter of us opening to that nature, seeing and opening to its goodness, that goodness that's greater than any of our worldly conditions. And so this is something that I invite us to do consciously this week, if we all could, and those of you who are joining us on live stream. We're going into this Thanksgiving period. If you come on Wednesday evening, this is going to be our ritual of giving thanks for that which we have and the ass essence of God in and around us. So I invite us to find times each day to pause and really soak in the pleasure of something simple and give thanks for our divine nature that allows us to do that. And then share some act of love or kindness, some way of sharing some joy with another, and give thanks for our divine nature that allows us to feel that. As we, in a sense, baptize ourselves by ridding ourselves of that error thinking of God being absent in this moment or in this situation, we find our ways back into Eden. We find our ways back into the heavenly experience. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. So as we turn our attention inward and just allow ourselves to feel that part of us that every moment seeks to be at peace, to be joyful, to feel fulfilled, and to recognize that as the impulse of God, that one life, that one power, that one infinite invisible out of which everything comes into being, that lives and moves and expresses itself through all that is, that is ever present in me, in each person here, in every being everywhere, in all of life itself. We can feel separate from it, but it is always there. And knowing this, I speak my word for us right here, right now, knowing that we can acknowledge it is part of our human unfoldment to feel separate in order to awaken to the truth of our oneness with God. And so right here, right now, if there's any area where we are feeling that God is just not here in this part of my life, or there's a situation in the world that we just feel, it just looks like God isn't there. We remember that, that presence of unconditional love that holds us, that holds everything in love. And that washes away that feeling of separation. That washes away the error thinking that causes the negative conditions in the world. We become vessels through which we contribute to the upliftment of our race and our planet into a greater knowingness of its oneness with God. I know that this prayer is a prayer for our families, our loved ones, any situations in the world that call to our attention. We just absolutely accept the presence of the divine being right at the center of all and revealing itself. We bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart, I just release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. Together we say.